Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. Brian Curran is a lifelong Minnesotan with a background in law enforcement and human services. She was recently elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives and serves as the vice chair of Minnesota's first queer caucus. Outside of being a legislator, Brianne is a big fan of karaoke, the Marvel Universe, and visiting local breweries. Please welcome my sister, Brianne Curran. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Mandy. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm super excited. We have Brianne Curran back with us. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, Representative Brianne Curran now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hi, Brianne. What an honor. <laughs> Hi, how are you two doing today? Good. How are you? So much has happened well. since your po- two podcast episodes. Catch us yeah. up. How long has it been? I think it's been well, two years. Hasn't yeah, because you, your last, your first episode was four, your second one was 46, I think. And we're on 144. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So yeah. A while ago. Yeah. A while. Catch us up. Oh, man. Where to start, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, last time we talked, I know we talked a little bit about public safety. That's a little bit about my experience there. Um, mm-hmm. But then I was asked to run for office for the state of Minnesota. And so, last pause there real quick. When you do, paint what asked looks like, paint what asked. Okay. Yeah. Like, what? who asked you? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, this is a fun story, and hopefully she'll hear it. My friend Heather Gustafson decided to run for state senate. She's an awesome lady who lives in my city of Badness Heights, and she just got involved locally, and she caught my attention because she just cared so much about what was going on. And I started to care more about what was going on in my own community. I thought about running for city council or for mayor. And Mm -hmm. so when my friend Heather said, you know, hey, I'm running for Senate and we need somebody to run for House. Will you do it? I just said, yes, I'll do it. So that's No it. reservations. No reservations. You weren't nervous. I was, ner- I was more nervous about running for city council or mayor, to be honest. And then when, when I was asked to run for state office, it just made so much sense. Um, something I never thought about doing ever in my life. But yeah, it, it, just, it just made so much sense. I just had to say yes. What did it look like after that? I still can't really believe that I said yes and that I'm doing it. <laughs> but here I we can't are. Either. <laughs> no, it's it's very odd because, you know, I'm still still me and still uh, the person who battles imposter syndrome thinking, you know, what did I do to deserve this awesome position? But every day I'm reminded of the awesome work that we get to do. It's pretty cool. So it was it was a whirlwind running for office because this is not anything that I had experience in before. Always been involved in the political process in a minimal way, right? Like mm-hmm. I voted, I was excited to vote. We watched debates growing up in our house. Like we we're mm-hmm. we paid attention to what was going on, but we didn't get involved in campaigns or anything like that. So yeah, got involved at the local level, had some, went through the local process of being formally nominated as uh, the person to represent our district, and then just went through the campaign season, knocking doors and raising money to send out tons and tons of mail that myself and everyone in my community, I'm sure was sick and tired of by November. (laughs) (laughs) Getting your own face in your own mailbox unannounced is a really strange thing to happen about every other day. Can we but, talk about a little a little about that, how strange it is to have some your campaigns sent to your own house? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we can talk about that. You know, and there were some, I got to tell you, you know, they're saying that I'm personally responsible for high gas prices. And I thought, if I'm this effective and I've never held public office before, I must be great at this, right? <laughs> and then I thought, well, man, if I am going to be that powerful, should I really run if I'm going to be the the evil person <laughs> behind these high gas prices? So, you know, they almost had me convinced to vote for somebody else. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was, it, was, it was pretty fun. And all in all, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. And 
uh, my opponent and I had had a conversation with each other in person that we had no intention of going after each other personally or being, you know, vindictive or trying to say anything negative. We just stuck to our points in our campaign and what our political differences were. So it was really nice to have to have that agreement. But now, how did that happen? Did you reach out? They reach out? So my opponent was the now former mayor of the city where I live. And so we had attended some events together. We kind of knew who each other were. And so, yeah, we had ran into each other at an event and we just shook hands and said, you know, this is really awkward. We know that we're pitted against each other. But at the end of the day, you know, somebody from Badness Heights is going to be working at the Capitol. And that's pretty darn cool. Uh, And we also knew that there's going to be a whole lot of people outside of our own groups and campaigns that would say whatever they wanted about either of us. And and that happens. And that wasn't to the fault of, of either of us either. So it was nice to have that understanding going into it. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't, I, how common is that? I would like to think it's more common, but I really, I don't know that it's really that common. I know there were a lot of races where opponents didn't really have conversations that were really outside of what you would normally have, like the normal pleasantries before and after a debate or something like that. But we were, we were staged across the street from each other at a community parade too. And so it was one of those things where our group was getting all excited and ready and her group was getting all excited and ready right across the street. So I just walked over and was like, Hey, once again, this is really awkward, right? Like good luck and have fun today. <laughs> and we just laughed about it. You know, it's, it's just part of the, part of the deal. Have you seen each other since? No. Can we talk a little bit about Minnesota and the TQIA plus presence in the last election? Yeah. Because I think not everybody would know that. Yeah. Super, super exciting year, not just for Minnesota, but it turns out for our country now. We, in the past, in the Minnesota state legislature, so we have the House of Representatives and we have our, our state Senate chamber. And at times there have been maybe one out LGBTQ community member in either chamber at a time. And then the last election we had, I think at the time we were running, there were, I want to say 11, 11 of us candidates who were out uh, between the house and the Senate who were actually out queer people running for office. And that was something that was historic that had never happened before. And so when we realized that we we started to come together realizing that if you know there's a real possibility that most of us were going to get elected and we needed to harness that power and that energy and do some real good with it because we knew that would be a first and we mm. had to we had to be the people that would lead that effort and recognize the you know the first that it was and how important it was and i think my campaign probably fell somewhere in the will hopefully probably get there, but there was a chance that maybe we wouldn't. And then there were other candidates that, you know, we knew that they were going to win. But after the election, we all won. And then after that, we had a couple more members who had been elected or previously already in office who had decided that they were comfortable enough coming out and joining joining our group. And so we have, that's what belonging is, right? You you, you have a sense of community and felt that they would have the support. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, there were folks too, who weren't necessarily not out, just not something that they really ever talked about, or maybe didn't think that people didn't know they were queer. Like they just Mm -hmm. maybe assumed everybody knew, but hadn't actually come out. And so it's been really nice to have those conversations and kind of see um, kind of see the group's dynamics evolve, especially over the last few months as we've grown closer and really done some work, not only in Minnesota, but have reached out to our colleagues in other states because of what we've seen going on for our community. So in some ways, well, it's brought us a lot closer. And a lot of what you have going on directly involves the rights of the LGBTQ community. So yeah, how awesome that you have a, an entire group of an out- representatives and senators representing, you know, their community who looks like them, who needs them to support 
their rights. So can you talk a little bit about what you're currently working on? Yeah. So right now, I would say actually just recently, the House passed the trans refuge bill off the House floor, which is super exciting because we're seeing states across the country do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Um, They're uh, criminalizing being trans, being transgender, raising trans kids, supporting your trans kids. All of those things are being outlawed and it results in families being torn apart. So Mm -hmm. To be in a state, to be in Minnesota, where our governor says, bring me the bill and I'll sign it yesterday, is mm. is an awesome, it's an awesome place to be. And right now we're just, um, you know, we're just hoping to see that it'll pass on the Senate floor soon so that the government can actually, or the governor can actually sign it and make it into law. That's so awesome. What is your Supreme Court ratio? That's a great question. I should know the answer to that, but I don't. <laughs> well, I'm actually looking it up on yours, your site real quick. It's going to take me a little while, but I think that's a fascinating thing too, right? Like as these special elections happen and as election season comes, this is where Democrats and even some independents fall really short is understanding the judicial system and how important right. it is that we have judges who, who believe in the laws and are going to support and back the laws. Right. Instead right. of their own interpretation yep, exactly. of what those laws are. Laws are only laws if they're enforced. Right. Yeah. And so that's, you know, as we've seen happen nationwide, that's something that Minnesota's paid a t- particular attention to is we know that if we don't have something codified into law, a Supreme Court can just decide that they don't like that anymore. And they're going to override a decision that was made decades ago mm-hmm. if they feel if they feel like it. So that's something I think in particular that our legislature is focusing on is that we know we know how delicate that balance can be when we leave things up to courts to decide. So it's important that we make sure we get that work done on the state side when we're talking about laws because that's that's a way that we can really solidify uh solidify protecting those rights for people and in protecting our freedoms. This is amazing. Like I, 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 if you have, if people want to get into politics, something I've wanted to do, but I scary, it's scary. And (laughs) the, the commitment is exciting. The backlash is frightening. I think that's, that's one of the scariest pieces, especially if you're not a middle to upper class white male in the U S then you've got to pretend to be as, as like that as, as middle-class upper white male as you can to actually be elected. (laughs) Yeah. You know, there is, there is a lot of that. And I think what we're seeing right now is people are really excited to see, uh, to, to see other candidates win and to see other people elected who more widely represent our areas. And so Mm -hmm. it's not just this you know, cookie cutter, untrustworthy politician that we're used to. We're seeing more people who are from our own backgrounds, whether it's from our neighborhoods, in our same socioeconomic status, in our same race, you know, other members of the queer community. I mean, there's there's so many people emerging in politics now who really just care about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that could be a testament to how, if you look at how our job market is working these days, people are really prioritizing things that just me- are meaningful, mm-hmm. kind of taking a turn in the workforce where people want to do things that they're proud of, not necessarily about money or, you know, status or things like that. It's, you know, doing things that you care about and feeling fulfilled by the work that you do. And that's what I see, at least in in the, the new class that I've come in with in this last election is Um, There's a lot of us who took significant pay cuts and made some big life changes and made some big risks by running for office and taking this job. But we all take it seriously and we're doing it because we want to help people. And I think that's a big that's a big deal. That's a big deal to see that happening on such a big level. That I was surprised that to hear that that those who are serving are able to do a full time job or part-time bro and do this job as well. Is that even, is it truly possible to carry on? Not for me. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say you're, you're there like yeah, every day. <laughs> yeah. My intent was to try. 
And some people are able to navigate that. I found myself so immersed in the work, um, especially as a new person, just making sure I'm caught up and being an effective leader. You know, there's there's a, a large number of us who are new in the legislature and I at least wanted to do my part to make sure that I wasn't slowing anything down mm-hmm. uh, by, you know, my my lack of knowledge of the inner workings, right? So I feel like our team's done a really good job of of really pushing through and we're taking advantage of the two years that we have to get a lot of priorities done because once the next election comes around, we're not guaranteed the same amount of time to get the same amount of good work done. So, I mean, there's that element too where we've got two sessions, we have two years to really dig in and do some good. So I've just been really focused on, you know, what what can we do in the next two years? Um, it's not a lot of time. So we really need to, to take all the hours we can every day. So when do you have to start campaigning again? Well, it never really stops. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say campaign season will really get into full swing in probably about a year or so. Wow. So like every other year you're campaigning then? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this summer will be a little lighter. I'll be able to spend a lot of time going out more into the community. And instead of introducing myself to people and trying to get campaign support, I'll be able to go out as their as their representative and visit people in their homes, visit businesses, all kinds of stuff, and just kind of get some more ideas for what we want to do for our community next session. Yeah. And I don't know if you know, Naomi, but speaking of hours, she was filibust- filibustered, what, two weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where t- you were there till 5.30 a.m.? Yeah. Was yep. it? Yeah. yeah that, was a, that was a long night. That was when we heard the trans refuge bill on the House floor. And we knew that it was going to be contentious. We knew that it could potentially go late. And once we saw that there was as much resistance as there was, that was, again, a moment where we as a team came together and just said, we're digging in. We're not going to let this go. And we're going to see it through to the end because we knew we had the votes to to pass the bill. And so, you know, if folks wanted to stay up all night and say despicable things, they have the right to do that. But at the end of the night, we still got our job done. So but it was actually Everybody at the beginning of tired. the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's you know some some people had to be at their next committee meeting three hours from then. So it was. So do yeah. you get to like do you literally have to stay up the whole time? Can you nap? Can you kind of snore off a little bit? And then when they're still talking, when you wake up, just be like, okay, thanks. <laughs> I don't want to give away too many secrets. Oh. <laughs> no, I will say that there is opportunity for nights like that. There there are some spaces where people, if they need to rest, yeah. can go and do that for a minute especially when it's so long and we have folks who might have some health concerns. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. So yeah, there are accommodations for situations like that, but for the most part, we're, we're still milling about on the house floor, either sitting in our seats or back in the retiring room. So we're, we're out, out and about until five thirty in the morning. If you could give, um, people next steps, if they're interested in getting into politics, like just say yes. Or yeah. Else. <laughs> yeah, just do it. Just say yes. Absolutely. And then no, I will I would say though for anybody who thinks that it's something that they want to do should absolutely go for it. And if there's somebody locally that you see you think is a good role model, a good example, tell them, reach out to them and I guarantee they're going to help you do it cuz it's a tough it's a tough thing to do and I think everybody who does this work can agree that it's one of the strangest jobs you could ever have. But when you get the chance, you absolutely should try it. And it's not forever. You know, it's it's something that if you if you do it and you just wanted to serve a term and be done, you can do that and just mm-hmm. try it out. But if you want it to if you want it to, to explore and, and see if it's something that you want to do long term, that's potentially an option, too. But, yeah, reach out to your elected officials, reach out to your local your local party or Senate district offices and, and just do it. You can do it. <laughs> Awesome. That's awesome. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hey, don't head out quite yet. Beyond Picket Fences is searching for guests to share their stories. There is so much power in both sharing your story and hearing stories you can relate to as a listener. You don't need any experience speaking. And even if you're nervous, it's okay. We've got you. If you or someone you know has a story to share, please reach out by emailing us at 
askme at bpfences.com or by clicking the link to our website in the show notes. Now go on with your fabulous self and have an amazing day.